these lovely ladies joining us today. Uh, thank you so much, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us to attend this training workshop today, um, which is on selling for women entrepreneurs. And uh, definitely we hope that the session will provide you with practical guidance and learning tips uh, for your daily business practices. Um, as most of you already know that UN Women is in collaboration with NAMA Women Advancement is implementing this program, which is on stimulating equal opportunities for women entrepreneurs in the UAE. So we hope and we know as well that you are facing various challenges trying to succeed in your businesses here in the UAE and internationally as well. So therefore, the aim is to support you building your capacities, tapping on various UAE adapted topics. Uh, so this is our first se session and you will be always uh, notified whenever, whenever uh, we have and soon we will update you with what is coming up. Um, so now, uh, thank you so much all again, and uh, I will leave the floor for our lovely trainers, Jennifer Blandos and Kelly Whitehead, Whitehead who are running today's workshop. Enjoy. Thank, thank you so much, Hiba. Kelly and I are really excited to be here with everyone, and it's so nice to see. So we're up at about 88 participants right now. We asked uh, rather than doing a webinar, we wanted to make this a regular Zoom meeting. And the reason why we wanted to do that is this is such a crucial topic for all of you that we wanted to make it as engaging as possible. So we are going to be using the chat box and we are going to be using the breakout rooms and getting you to do some activities. So we will ask you, please do engage with us as much as possible because we're here to help you and to share our expertise and our insight into the area of selling. And a number of you participated in a survey that was done by UN Women and NAMA Women Advancement Establishment last year. And I think a number of you also took part in the webinar that we did on International Women's Day. And one of the things that came out from the survey was that so many female entrepreneurs struggle with selling. They feel that this is a huge barrier for them to be able to grow their businesses. And when we were speaking with UN Women, this is one of the top things that we said, we have to help and we have to be able to give all of you ideas to be able to sell better and to be able to feel comfortable with selling. So for the next two hours, you have Kelly and I here and we're going to take you through a number of steps that have helped us with our businesses. I'm Jen Blandos. A number of you do know me. For those that don't know me, I've been an entrepreneur for about 20 years. I've owned businesses in Europe, in the GCC, and uh, I have found my companies have been, you know, kind of smallish, 15, 20 employees. And when I first started my businesses, Selling was one of those things that I needed to do, but I didn't really know how to do. And I didn't know how to find the people that wanted to go and buy my product. So I, I, spent, it a lot, I spent a lot of time trying to get it right. And I was very lucky very early on in my business that I managed to make the right connections, which enabled me to grow my business quite quickly from startup to making seven figures in British pounds. My first business was in London, and then my second one was in Dubai uh, to grow my business to seven figures in less than two years. And this is all down to sales and being able to understand how to sell well. So I do really want to be able to share that expertise with you. I have also been involved in Female Fusion Network, and a lot of you know me from there. I'm also, as well as my business area, I'm also involved in supporting a lot of female entrepreneurs with the lovely Kelly through Female Fusion Network. And I'm Kelly Whitehead. Thank you, Jen. Um, I'm a marketing consultant of over 20 years. Um, I've been working independently for the past 15. And what that means is as essentially a solopreneur with working alongside other creative agencies and entities and venues and people, um, 
across the UK, also into Europe um, and in the UAE since 2008. Um, I specialised in digital um, from 2008 and also working with women and families and children with a natural progression into supporting female entrepreneurs and the startup of the Female Fusion Network, which is almost six years ago. So within my work with Female Fusion, I speak and engage and support daily with women in business across the UAE. So as Jen mentions, we bring to you the experience of having run our own businesses, but also almost a 24 seven insight into ladies such as yourselves who are creating, growing and running your own entities in the UAE. We have a question for you. This is the very yeah. first question and there's a poll feature within Zoom itself. So we want to ask you specifically, how do you, right now, as you sit here on Tuesday morning, how do you feel about selling? How does that word make you feel right now today within your business and your ventures? So if you can answer that, the poll that's popped up on the screen right there, if you can answer and we have, how do you feel? Comfortable, which is perfectly great. Some of you are gonna love sales and that's fantastic. Uncomfortable, I know I have to do it, but I'm not sure how, or I love it. I just like to do more of it and who doesn't want to sell more? Yeah. So please, thank you for your participation. Um, this is really important for us to get a feel about how you how you feel right now today as we sit here on this Tuesday morning. It's a good mix. I'm looking at the results coming in and yeah. I'm, I'm not overly surprised. Yeah. <laughs> keeps changing, keeps changing. Not many people are very comfortable with it. That's okay. Not so far, it, it's, it's all good. There's no right or wrong answers yeah. today. Quite the opposite, quite the opposite. Okay. Okay. So that's an interesting snapshot. And we're also going to check in with you at the end and see if maybe we're going to have given you some other ideas and help you feel a little bit more confident about selling at the end of this. So are we gonna ending? Are we gonna end the polling? We've had last, uh, last call, we've got 78%. 78%, yeah. We can, yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll just yeah, leave it out for a second. But do you, what, one of the things, one of the things that we find interesting, and Kelly and I speak about this a lot, and also with other female entrepreneurs, is that oftentimes the way that selling is taught to us can be quite masculine. And we did a bit of research into that, and we're wondering why, because we did a, a workshop a while ago about selling, and one of the feedback that we got from a number of ladies is they were like, yeah, I really liked it, but I just felt it was a bit masculine. It didn't really speak to me. It didn't, I didn't feel that that really spoke to me. And we were looking at sales books and what's interesting because a lot of times if you don't know how to sell or you don't know how to do something, you go to the internet or you go buy a book or you talk to people to find out how to do it. And out of all the sales books, the top 100 sales books listed on Amazon, only three of those are written by women. And that I, I found that, well, surprising, but not surprising. And, you know, I, I, and so because the way that men sell, and I, I, I speak to, to the men in my life about this as well. And, you know, because they think that I'm a bit crazy going, oh, no, you're just a feminist. Everybody sells the same way. But it's not men and women. The way that we do things is slightly different. And the way that women sell is different. And there's no right or wrong answer to that or to how we sell, but it's just that it's slightly different. Now, sales doesn't have to be scary, not at all. We just need to reframe how it is that we're selling and what we think about selling. Sorry. And so, as I said, as women, the way that we sell is different and that's okay and we're going to talk about that we're going to talk over the next couple of hours about tools that you can have in your toolkit that will help you sell more and feel more comfortable with selling okay so in today's workshop here's what we're going to go through we're going to chat about why it is we might be afraid to sell or what it is that holds us back from doing so 
we're going to talk about nailing your offer. Now, I know that sounds a bit extreme, nailing your offer. Um, it's a phrase I use and a word we use quite a lot. And I just want to reiterate that when we talk about offer, we're talking about anything that you sell. So whether you trade in products or whether you uh, in services, obviously we're seeing a lot of coaches and we're seeing a lot of people in business to business type selling. Your offer is exactly what it is that you sell, whether that is yourself and your professional services or products or anything similar to that. So just bear that in mind language wise as we're going through and we talk about your offer, that is who you are and what it is you sell. So we also need to be super clear on who we're selling to and identifying your ideal paying client because that's what it's about. <laughs> not everybody, not everybody's gonna buy what we sell um, and we don't want everybody to, to, to buy what we sell. We have to be super clear on who we're selling to. We need to be clear on building connections on social media. And the reason we specify social media going throughout this workshop is really because of the opportunities that in 2021, it gives you for marketing, advertising, brand awareness, and essentially sales of your products and services versus the opportunities or lack of that we have currently offline. We need to look at developing authentic relationships. We need to look at how to close the deal. Getting in front of your ideal paying client is one thing, but how can we transform that meeting, those emails, that connection into actually making the sale? And also, how can we handle rejection? Because again, this is something that stops us from actually making the contact in the first place, is how we react personally to being told no and also how we can manage that in a way that creates positive working relationships going forward. And also right at the very end, I'm gonna to talk to you about leaving money on the table, which is a phrase we use a lot. And what does that mean? Leaving money on the table means how you can create more sales and opportunities for yourselves from things that you already have and by listening to your customers and clients. Kelly, That's just before we idea. jump to the next slide as well, I just wanted to, I, I've been looking at the chat box and a lot of ladies have been saying that they feel super uncomfortable with selling, they feel scared, it leaves them with a pit in their stomach, frightened. Someone says selling is survival, so they need mm. to do it anyways. A lot of people are saying they're anxious, unsure. I love it, but I feel I'm not aggressive or proactive enough. What's, it, what's interesting, Jen, and, um, and really encouraging is it doesn't surprise us that, that people are feel fearful from selling. I think we, we fully yeah. expected that as a popular answer. Um, but however, um, the majority of the respondents, just by a percentage or so, actually said that they know they have to do it. They want to just do more of it. And that's really, really encouraging because at the end of the day, if you're in business, you're in sales. And, you know, as we mentioned, can it be selling your idea? It's like you're selling absolutely anything. Um, and we have to frame these things as sales. We have to frame marketing as sales with the end in mind, because if our business or services don't have customers or clients, you're running a very time consuming and or expensive hobby ladies. We have to, we're in business for a reason and that is to close these deals. And this language feels quite masculine. This language, absolutely. And somebody saying, you know, most sales trainers are men, getting past the gatekeepers yeah. is a challenge too. And we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about the role of procurement. Um, and and it, it's just really important. But I'm very, very encouraged by the fact that so many ladies said, look, yes, I want to do more of it. I want to learn how to do more of it, but I'm okay with it. But the, rec the recognition that purely sales is what is going to keep your business afloat and also help you grow um, is really, really important too, because without any sales, we don't have any business. And you just have an expensive hobby, as Kelly likes to say. <laughs> I've had plenty of those over the years. <laughs> so what is it? Why are we afraid to sell, ladies? What is it that keeps us? Teresa, Working myself up to the act of selling feels really scary. Once I'm in the flow, I'm okay. It's the awful feeling of the first step. And I completely understand. And I'm sure so many of our ladies here today will, will have that feeling as well and, and, and understand. And like you say, Teresa, once you're in the flow, it feels okay. It's that first step. It's taking the first step. And charging what you're worth, pricing, all of these, it's not just about taking that sale. There are so many components to this. And this is exactly what exposes our vulnerabilities, I think, especially as women who just generally tend to have less confidence in these activities than men. Not all women, of course, but we know from our day-to-day -day experience of working with female entrepreneurs, 
that no matter how successful, and I'm talking about women who are making money, who are closing deals, who, who run organizations, large organizations, 100 staff, 200 staff, right down to the solopreneur, most women we speak to, 90%, I would even go as far as to say, feel vulnerable when it comes to selling. There's the fear of being rejected. Yes, I'd like to sell more, but what if they say no? This big, scary mind monkey of imposter syndrome, which we could talk about in a different session and talk about for hours, I'm sure. And again, even some of the most successful women that I know still feel that they suffer from the famous imposter syndrome. Why would people choose you over the competition? It all comes down to mindset and confidence. And with the basics, confidence of what it is that you sell, who it is you want to sell to, how you can be better at it, and how you can create more sales from what it is you already have and have created. When you feel confident in being able to do that, you will find that flow that Teresa mentioned in the chat box, you will find that that flow comes more naturally, leaving you time to feel more enthusiastic, better, and happier, happier in your day-to-day -day business life and not putting everything off because procrastination is the enemy of being able to create and grow these businesses that you're all so passionate about. And you know, at the end of the day, a lot of people talk about personal brand and it's actually a really, really fashionable topic at the moment. And the reason why I say fashionable is there's lots of talk about personal brand, how to improve your personal brand. And I just want to say, you've all been a personal brand since the day that you were born. Some are really good personal brands <laughs> and some people are not so good personal brands, but every one of us from the day that we're on this earth, we are a personal brand because we are the product or the service. It's our values, it's our reputation, it's the way that people remember us. It's not just about having a nice headshot and a pink jacket in your photograph or any of those things or even the shiniest website or, or the, 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 the most attractive anything, the best social media presence or anything like that. Even being in the newspapers, on the radio, all of these visible things that we tend to equate with business success None of it means anything unless yourself or the people representing your business services or products are remembered positively for your values, your reputation, your customer service, and of course the end product as well. So remember, you are the personal brand. You really are the personal brand. Again, whether we like it or not, we are the product and the service. So what we want you to look at first and really have a think about is nailing your offer because this comes right back to the beginning of what it is that we do. And if anybody's, um, if anybody recognizes the phrase, not being able to see the wood for the trees, I appreciate it's a very English saying, I'm sure it translates um, into other languages and cultures as well, but not being able to see the wood for the trees would be somebody who is busy working in their business and has maybe kind of lost the foresight or the clarity. And that happens when we're working every day and we're working over weekends and we're working alongside our families and around our families. It's very, very easy to lose sight of the basics whilst we fall into the trap of being busy with other things. So I really want us to take a step back and think about nailing your offer. And to some of you, it could be quite obvious. I sell shoes. I'm a lifestyle coach. I'm a nutrition coach. I'm, I work in carpentry. I provide X, Y, or Z. Step back, think about how clear, simple, and easy to understand your offer is because confused people do not convert. So even when you find yourself in front of your ideal paying customer or ideal paying client, how you present your offer and services and products succinctly within 60 seconds, if written down within literally two or three lines, one paragraph at most, how clear, simple, and easy to understand would it be if I met you today and you told me what it is you do, who you are and what it is you sell? Because confused people do not convert and a confusion equals sales. So we really, really need to be super clear on our offer right from the very start. And the thing is, you have to know what your offer is. And that sounds crazy. That sounds ridiculous. Absolutely ridiculous. But you have to know what your offer is before you can go and present it to anybody else. Once we've worked at our offer, it sounds quite straightforward, but it's not sometimes, is that when I speak with female entrepreneurs is that when I speak with them and say, well, who are you selling to? A lot of times the answer is, well, everyone. So, you know, 
yeah, all men, women, children. But a lot of times the answer isn't everyone. Everybody has what is referred to as an ideal paying client or ideal paying clients number of people. And it's very important to get quite specific on who they are. So who would that person be? So for example, if you're selling jewelry, it's going to be women, but maybe your jewelry has crystals in it or something like that. So maybe you would want to go more detailed that it would be women who are into maybe yoga, wellness, that sort of lifestyle, and be able to identify those people to really, what we say, niche down to find out who they are and what they're interested in. And the reason for that is when we understand who they are and what they're interested in, is it's much easier for us to be able to identify, make some tweaks to our products so what value can our product or service bring to them, but also to be able to identify how it is that we can reach out to them. And what's really important in sales is typically, especially in this region, sales doesn't happen instantly. It's not something that happens right away. You meet a client or you meet a customer and they buy right away. If they do, fantastic. That's super great. But I would say most times that people want to be able to, to know who you are, to know who your business is. So they want to be able to know, like, and trust you. And I found this with, with my business that I, I've been in this region for a number of years. And one of the things in this region that is different to, let's say, for example, working in Europe is that, especially if you're working in a services business, and my, my companies have been more in the services area, is that you're very fortunate if you can close a deal right away. Typically what happens is you will end up meeting with the client, maybe meeting with the client again, maybe meeting with them later on. And I've had some deals where they have been really great, but it's taken a year, maybe even two years to actually come to fruition. And so sometimes as well, that that's where we need to make the investment in the relationship, but eventually those relationships end up paying off. Now, this is where it can get really frustrating as well, is that, you know, you really, especially with, with the pandemic, a lot of people feel pressured to, to win business, to get clients. And you can come across sometimes as a bit pushy if you need the, the business. And so this as well is where we need, to, we need to be invested in those relationships and understand that a quick sale isn't necessarily going to come. But this is where when we understand who our ideal paying client is, is it helps us understand why they buy. So, and why do our customers and clients want to buy from us? What is it that they're looking for from me? So when you find your ideal paying client, it's so much easier to be able to connect with them. One of the things that, that we hear though, is a lot of people go, well, I know I need clients. I know I need customers, but I don't know where to find them. And so in the end, they end up putting like posts on social media or, you know, sending, uh, creating posters in Canva or something and sticking them on different Facebook groups, selling, you know, their jewelry or bikinis or consulting business or SEO business. And, but the problem is, is that that is not where your ideal paying client is. For example, you wouldn't have a business, let's say, for example, that sells um, kids bath products. And you would not go onto a business group and go and post about your kids' bath products unless you are looking for partners to maybe have with your business to help your business grow. But you know, you might have better luck on mums groups because that's where the mums would be looking for your product. So you need to have an idea of who your ideal paying client is and where you can find them. So you can find them, for example, with your current clients. One of the things that I think we tend to forget sometimes is because we're so busy trying to get more clients for our businesses that we forget that sometimes our best source of business is with the clients that we already have and the contacts that we already have. They already know you, they like you, they trust you because they bought from you. And so they are one of the best resources for you to be able to use. Previous ones as well, maybe they haven't done business with you for a while or they did business with you in a previous business. 
also to look within your existing network, and that might be within friends and family, but also on maybe social media groups that you're on, because I think a lot of women are quite active on social media groups, and you end up getting to know people virtually as well and develop a, a bit of a persona for ho who those people are. Also go to networking events. There's a lot of different networking events that happen within the UAE, both online and offline. The same thing with conferences, meetings. There's so many places. Once you identify who your ideal paying client is that you're able to find them. Now, one thing that helps as well when we meet with potential customers is to be able to have an elevator pitch. And I found that this is quite a challenging thing. How many of you can say what you have to offer, the benefits of your product and service within less than 60 seconds? Can you do that? Can you explain it in clear, simple, and easy to understand language? I'd love to see that in the chat box, how people feel about that. Exactly. Yeah, a lot of people say no. And Hopefully, yes. this should be one of the first. There's a few people that have said yes, but for women, if you want to be able to sell, one of the first things that you can do that will help you is to be able to think about what it is that you offer, the benefits of your product and service, if you were to be able to meet your ideal paying client. Now, what Kelly and I are going to do is we're going to All have right. a bit of fun. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to have a bit of fun. We're going to break you up into groups of four and it's going to be randomly put together. So you're going to meet new ladies. So this is a great opportunity to network as well. And we're going to give you seven minutes of as a group. And what we would love is for you to be able to give your elevator pitch, even if it's not perfect, don't worry, because this is, we're here to learn, right? And so we're here to practice and to get better. So you will be randomly put in groups and we would like you to give your elevator pitch to other women who are in the group and then uh, give each other individual feedback if you can. Try to be positive and nice and supportive. Um, and there's things that we can always learn and get better from as well. Now, a few people have said that they can't participate because they're working right now. So just don't accept the invitation to go into the, into the breakout group, but we're going to have you sitting here for seven minutes and then we'll come back. So if you don't want to take part, just uh, mute yourself, go grab a coffee and we'll be back in seven minutes. Can so I, you- Can I- interject there sorry Jen to urge yes. any of you who feel that you want to but are too nervous pop in say hello tell everybody your name and what it is at least that yeah you, there is this is not to catch anybody out there is absolutely no wrong answers um, if it terrifies you we fully understand but we deliberately wanted to give you an opportunity to say hello to somebody else and actually yes kind of put you on the spot but not in a way that makes you horrifically uncomfortable so please bring yourselves out of your comfort zones for those confident ladies amongst you go and, and put your face in front of uh, some new people as well and everything's yeah. an opportunity right so i urge all of you if able to uh, to join in and look, one of the reasons why we did this is that we hear from women all the time that you want to sell more that you want to be able to network that you want to be able to make new contacts so we thought it would help with your learning, but it would also enable you to meet some other wonderful women that you might not necessarily have met before. So go into this with an open mind and have fun. So UN Women Team, if you can randomly put our teams into groups of four, please. And then you can just say not now if you don't want to join, okay? I'm joining. Have fun, ladies. <laughs> Okay, but I'm going to join a group and then I'll pop out. I think as admin as well that I can move to the groups. Join. I'm gonna, yeah, yeah, I'm going to stop my screen share for a second. Yeah, and then we'll I think I will like join that. as well. 
Yeah, just so we have an opportunity and then I'll come back. Just want to make sure that everything is okay here and then I'll join. Okay. Are we in new breakout rooms? No, we are on the main room. <laughs> oh, sure, sorry. I've just sent a message in the chat, so perhaps they're, they're able to, to see it. Oh, hello. I'm in a new room. Yeah, me too. Oh, hello. <laughs> my apology. My name is Eval Nasser. My camera is off. I'm in a very busy place. I just hope that you can hear me. Yes, I can. Yes, I can. Mm -hmm. Eva, I am Sarah Al Abdullah. Nice to meet you. <laughs> nice to meet you. They are reorganizing the, the breakout okay. room. So how many are we in this room? <laughs> just so we understand uh, this how is, much this time is the main we have. Okay, great. I am also here. I'm Rubab. I think everyone are here now. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Um, hello, everybody. Hello. I'm Rita. Hello, nice to meet Hi. you. Hi. Nice meeting you too. I'm uh, Rita Janssen. I'm a, I'm a lawyer, a partner in a law firm. I've been in the UAE for 29 years, looking forward to more. And uh, have seen it all. I can help you if you have any legal questions or re legal requirements. I'm happy to support you. That's very noble of you. Thank you very much, Rita. Uh, my name is Eval Nasser, and I'm a dispute resolution practitioner, or in other words, mediator. I love resolving conflicts, and um, I'm thinking of partnering with a good lawyer because I am not a lawyer by background. I don't have to be. Uh, my passion is um, resolving either workplace disputes, relationship disputes, or supporting the corporations, uh, non-for-profit organizations when they are facing the challenges. That's what I do. I was on mute. Anybody want to unmute themselves? Tell us who you are and what you're doing. Hi, this is Aisha Kode, Hi. I would, uh, hi, dear. Um, I have been uh, in and out of uh, three rooms, the breakout rooms by now. The, and I don't know what's happening. No, I'm not. I'm not. Um, I'm not managing these breakout rooms, and I'm slightly confused too. So you'll have to excuse uh, okay. me on that point. Okay. So is it just both of us here? 
It looks like it, although I'm seeing other people. Um, Hi, Kelly. Kelly, I'm trying to sort this out. Hibba set up the rooms wrong. So I'm just going through and manually moving people around because a number of people haven't joined. So if you just leave it with me, I'm trying to sort it out and we'll get people moved into other groups because there's some ladies who haven't joined groups. Well, I, I won't touch so, anything then, but... Um, yeah, leave it leave it with me next time I do it. <laughs> so. Yeah. This time I had made up my mind, any breakout room, I'll speak. Because every time I was there, I wasn't able to speak. Oh, bless you. So I think as well, hang on, I'm just moving a few people. Uh, room 14. Because there's some ladies who haven't joined. So Kelly, you're in the main room. So everybody who's in the main room is showing Kelly do you want to go to a group um I don't mind so you're actually, Kelly, you're allocated to room 19. It just says that you haven't joined. Do you not have a notification asking you to no, join? No, well, I just hope it's working for others. Well, we have a big group of ladies in the main group. So why don't we play around with the ladies who are in the main group, ask for some volunteers who would like to, and we can just do some elevator pitches that way. Unfortunately, not everybody will get to, but um, we should be able to have some. Kelly, do you want to, can you manage that while I'm sorting well, this out? I can. I'm talking to people, but um, I don't think I'm not getting anything back. Are you in your group or are you in the main I group? I believe so. I, I don't know. I believe so. I see about, uh, I see a number of ladies here within the main group. We probably yeah, got about I see 25. Them. I see them and I'm talking, but. Um... Okay. Who in this main group would like to do an elevator pitch? Raise your hand. Or right in the chat box. Okay. Uh, Nit Nityashi, I'm sorry. Yeah. Tell no, me how fine. to pronounce your name, lovely. How do I pronounce your name? It's Nityashri. Nityashri. Okay. I love that. Let's hear your elevator pitch. You've got a minute. Okay. All right. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Nityashri Bahat. Um, I have been in UAE for the last seven years. I'm originally from Canada. And uh, um, what I do is corporate maternity wellness. And uh, this is, is, is quite niche uh, in the sense that I directly deal with pregnant working women uh, in organizations, in uh, SME startups or MNCs. Uh, the issue that we are facing is that majority of the MNCs have a wonderful uh, way of providing excellent care for pregnant working women in terms of retaining them. But SMEs and startups don't have capital enough to invest in women. So we are seeing a lot of talented women, just like all ourselves, um, who have exited the workforce. Um, who may want to come back and uh, stay. So what I do is I provide uh, uh, performance and productivity-based uh, coaching in helping them stay relevant uh, in workplace while they're there um, and as well when they come back to workplace. I Thank don't you. think it was clear and concise. <laughs> Super. Excellent. Now, who else would like to go? Aisha's got a hand up. <laughs> Yeah, can I start, beautiful ladies? Yes, go. Uh, all right. Uh, uh, Jim is an uh, organization through which we work is architectural construction engineering companies by giving them. Aisha, I'm sorry, we're going to have to stop you because we can't hear you. I think your internet connection isn't great. You keep freezing. I love the fact that you work in industry. Yeah, I want to hear. You can hear me. Maybe, maybe if you can um, go somewhere else to get a, a better connection. Who else would like to go? Well, Aisha, Aisha, we'll give you a second to see if you can get your internet a bit faster. Who else would like to go? Come on, ladies. I can go. Yeah. Hi. Good Hi, Fatima. 
Hi, Takima, you said that perfectly. Thank you. Right. <laughs> um, so I am a self-love and life coach. And basically what that is, is I coach women on loving themselves, figuring out what their passions and purposes are um, and how that translates into having more healthy and loving relationships in their lives. So pretty short and sweet, but that's, but that's what I do. That is a great elevator pitch. Thank you. <laughs> short and sweet is great. Who's next? Volunteers. I can see all your names and welcome. Thank you for joining us. Samar, you're the Ambreen, Sousen, Melda, Passant, Rasha, Cecile, Saima, Patricia. Any more volunteers? We've got about another, got just over two minutes. Yeah, Hi. we have enough for two. Alia. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Alia. Hi, Alia. <laughs> How are you? Very well, thank you. Tell us who you uh, are and what you do. Actually, I am a financial coach and planner. So I provide my um, coaching for uh, a fair to, um, to change the money mindset with the people. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm working with individual and a small business. Super, it's so important. Money mindset is feels like it's the root of everything for all of us at the moment. So that's great to know. Thank you very much for that. Last one. We have time for one more. Sasan has her name up, I think, or hand up. Hi guys. Hi. Can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Hi, I'm actually driving, but I thought I'd give it a shot. <laughs> Please stop All driving. Right, so <laughs> <laughs> So, um, well, I just, um, I'm on a red light. My, so my name is Sosin and I am a um, social media and digital consultant. Um, I've been uh, doing this for about uh, 10 years now and I've decided to branch out and be a solopreneur. Um, my offer is basically to help um, anyone from like a small SME all the way to large organizations um, to make their brands matter and to ensure that their content and their story gets to their right audience. That's what I do. Perfect. Super. Okay, I'm going to bring everybody back. So we've got 60 seconds. So enough for one more. Does anyone want to go come fast? Come on. Oh, Janaika, Janaika Elders, come on. <laughs> Somebody. One more. Let's fill this time. Come on, turn off hands. your microphone. We have hands we have up. So somebody just unmute themselves and talk to us. And let's go. Irene. Oh, hi. Hi, everyone. Hi, Irene. Um, yes, hi, my name is Irene. I am a talent acquisition specialist, have been in the region for about nine years now. So I focus primarily on um, resourcing or recruitment for international law firms, so the legal sector, as well as um, uh, interacting with graduates just to be able to um, groom them in terms of their career and what they're looking to do in terms of the legal sector. Thank you. Thanks, Irene. Thank you. Okay. I think is everybody back now? Looks like everyone is back back so back how did it go <laughs> how did it go everyone well was it I, harder than you thought <laughs> thanks may I got a thumbs up from may i'm seeing people's faces there <laughs> it was really nice it was oh, really thank you. no it's it, it, it's um it's a funny thing putting people on the spot like that of course and um it's just fantastic to see so many of you do it confidently um it's interesting that some people can clearly be more succinct than others and that's not a bad thing but it's certainly something to practice um and it just shows you how kind of difficult i don't find it too easy believe it or not and everybody who knows me knows how much i can speak and talk it's not a problem but it's being able to bring Concise. all that information down into clarity because again confused people don't convert they may remember you it's not a dead loss it, it it's not a case they're going to think badly of you if you can't clarify your offer so carefully but again it just it just reiterates the confidence in yourselves your products and your services to be able to go into a room or even write an email it's not just about face to face 
um, online, introduce yourself and be able to really quickly state who it is that you are and what products and services that you sell or what you specialize in or even what it is you're looking for. Because as somebody put in the chat box, Jen, you know, that elevator pitch can change dependent on who it is you're pitching to. Yes. Don't all yep. expect that there was... Um, so Sousen in our breakout room is a social media and digital consultant. And she told me that she works with businesses from small to large. So she's going to have a very different elevator pitch, essentially an offer proposition, depending on if she's speaking to a solopreneur or if she's going into one of the corporates or international businesses. And that's absolutely perfectly fine. It just gives you more work to do because there's never a one size fits all. There's lots of shades of gray and everything, but we really wanted to strip it back and like I say, pop you on the spot and be able to kind of ask you, can you clearly tell us who you are and what it is you do? And if you, again, you feel that you're not seeing the woods for the trees as clearly as you might have done maybe 12 months ago or things have changed for you over the past 12 months haven't they changed for everybody in this whole new world that we live in um your offer might be realigned or your services might be realigned or you might be a bit like me and made some massive changes in the past 12 months and really have to sit back and look again from the start what it is that you want where it is you're going to who your ideal clients are and how it is that you can speak to them. And this isn't a kind of back to basics, how to start selling. So, so many of us are actually, again, it's been such a strange year for everybody, globally, top to bottom, large companies to solopreneurs, to families, women and men. And I think we really have to kind of go back to basics to be able to move forward into this whole new world that we're in. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to bring up the presentation again. So just before we move on from this, this is something that I find really helpful for, for myself. And I actually have made use of this technique myself over the past year. And to, to really kind of think about who I'm going to target, I think about maybe 10 customers that have done business with me, but maybe I'm not working with right now. And list them down and then I'll reach out to them in a way and I typically won't reach out to them to sell but it will be more that I'll reach out to them to check in how are things how are things going just to give you updates on what's going on with us and oftentimes when I have those conversations with those clients is they'll be like oh actually I'm really glad that you called me I actually have a need in a couple of weeks or in a couple of months, why don't you tell me what you can do? Or why don't you send me your latest brochure? Or can you give me a proposal for this? Now, I know some of you are thinking going, oh, but I don't have any, I don't have any clients. And so you can also think about people that maybe you would like to have clients or customers and create a wish list and find a way that you would be able to reach out to them. Mainly, and you know, we touched on this previously, mainly the amount of networking and conversations that you're going to have are usually going to be via online platforms and social media. It's obviously a great opportunity to raise your profile, but it's really important, again, to be able to plan and really think about how you're going to raise your profile in a way. It's very, very easy to spend all day online and feel that you are networking or you are trying to promote yourself or your business, but actually, you're wasting a lot of that time, you're doom scrolling, you're flitting about here, there and everywhere, you're possibly trying to promote products and services in particular networking groups, either online and off, um, that don't have, and this is again, is the importance of identifying your ideal paying client, because if I could say to you, who would you like to be a client? And your answer is, well, anybody. That is a wrong answer. I said there's no wrong answers today, but that is the wrong answer because for various reasons, not everybody is your ideal paying client. Not everybody who comments, not everybody who supports you online or on social media, if they're friends or they're just well wishers, is going to be your ideal paying clients. And whilst we absolutely categorically do want to have the reputation as somebody who's helpful, somebody who's friendly online and face to face, you always have to have at the back of your mind, where am I best spending my time online to be able to generate new relationships, new connections and, and, and more sales. And, you know, we have a lot of B2B ladies, uh, business to business ladies here today who 
are not going to find their ideal paying clients within say Facebook groups, for example, or by utilizing purely Instagram. The region, it seems to be obsessed with Instagram and it all seems to be about how do I get 10,000 followers? But you know what, if I could give you 10,000 followers, I would, but I would very much prefer to give you 10 paying customers. There's a lot of broke influencers out there, put it this way. Here, the vanity metrics of social media are not necessarily what is right for you and the growth and development of your business and services. So you really need to identify which channels are important to your customers. Again, having identified your ideal paying client. So with regards to business and industry, if you're a business setup consultant, for example, Instagram is good for your visibility how likely are you to convert your followers into customers? Now, again, there's various conversations we can have and sessions with regards to actual content generation and where to spend your time online and what kind of content fits which platform. But really and truly, by identifying your ideal paying client, that will help you identify which social media channels um, are more important to your customers and where you can be more visible. So whether that's on LinkedIn, whether it's via Facebook, whether it's YouTube, whether it's Pinterest, whether it's um, platforms such as Medium or Reddit, or for example, it's not just all about social media platforms such as that. There's various, obviously, other online forums and ways um, ways for you to network and to approach your ideal paying client. And once you've identified the ideal paying client, you will be thinking hard about basically where it is that they hang out online or what is more suitable to your business or industry. Again, the reason why we're focusing on um, on, on social media is because it's the likelihood, it is 99.9% .9 of your marketing strategy is going to be based online and not just via social media, via engaging with your database on email as well. So when we use social media, it's so, so important, the first impressions that count and the things that resonate with people to basically be a giver and not a taker. You're gonna use social media as an opportunity to raise your profile. You're gonna be helpful. You're gonna give genuine advice and of course, always be positive. You do need to expect to be giving away advice for free. And I want to go back to a point made earlier in the chat box and please forgive me because I can't see the name or scroll back to the comment, but you will know who you are. When you said, I'm known as an expert in my industry, However, you're giving away all the information for free and it's not converting into paying clients for you, basically, essentially, is what the lady was saying. Now, we do have to expect to be giving away advice for free. However, only we can set our own boundaries. So it's really, really important for visibility. Let's call it brand awareness, whether it's personal brand as a solopreneur, whether it's brand awareness uh, for you. Um, for your business as a whole, whether it's yourself doing it or a member of your staff or colleagues. We do need to expect to be giving away advice for free. However, it's entirely up to us what boundaries we set as to how much of that we're going to do and what our sales process is after giving away that advice. But we did want to really, really stress the point about being a giver um, as opposed to simply fly posting around the internet. Because let me just tell you something. I don't know why it's so popular, why so many people try to do it. It doesn't work. People buy from people. So when we're creating our content and we're giving helpful tips, we're posting articles and videos, and again, an entirely different training session about what that content should be or how you can find the time to do that because we all get caught up in the busyness of the online world. Um, we give some advice, exactly, Karen, we give some advice for free. No, like trust factor, people buy from people. We have to be seen to be credible. We have to be seen to be helpful. We have to be seen as nice people. People want to do business with other nice people. So we absolutely have to give from that, from, from that basis. However, the boundaries then stop with us. And if we have a solid, let's call it a sales process, again, sounds very masculine and very corporate, but if we have a sales process within ourselves, that leads us to understand how much we give away for free. Maybe if you're a coach, you do what they call discovery calls or sales calls. And I've had this conversation with a lady saying, you know, I spent 45 minutes on the phone and I can't convert them. You don't have to spend 45 minutes on the phone. You can practice how you can have these information sessions or discovery calls or messengers or WhatsApp or however it is that you're communicating with people. The boundaries are with you. And your time, and you can set that out from the outset, and you can be clear with people, okay, we've got 10 minutes, et cetera, et cetera, or it can be not so obvious, but you can command your own boundaries and your own time when it comes to how much it is that you want to give online. But it really is about building that no like trust factor to leave people with the positive impression that here is a woman who knows what she's doing, knows what she's selling. I know how to contact her. Um, I like her. I trust her.
I, I feel that I know her and this is the image that we need to be conveying across our channels. To contribute, to contribute. People notice and it works. Because who is it we trust? Do we trust somebody who posts a direct ad or a sales pitch online, or do we trust somebody who consistently shares knowledge and advice? And the difference is this, because you might think that's quite contradictory. I'm just saying, you know, give your, give your elevator pitch, give, give yourself an opportunity to be able to sell online. But this is not about literally fly posting. So say you've got a graphic, you know, and, and, and you're going around, let's use Facebook as an example. So selling and promotional days on Facebook groups and you think you're just gonna post a graphic and literally that's it, there's no caption, there's no relevance, it's just an advert to your latest sale or something like that, a special offer that you've got on. And we, we see it all the time and people make a habit of going around the internet posting basically advertisements and an advertisement is completely different to having a contribution. That's still a sales pitch, but it's completely different. And that's what we really, really wanted to reiterate. The difference in somebody who does that, somebody who simply posts and runs or somebody who consistently shares knowledge and advice. And I think I know the answer. I think I know the answer to who it is that you would trust and want to engage with going forward. So if maybe this is a habit that you've gotten into before or you find yourselves doing, just think twice about it because to be quite honest and truthfully, you're wasting your time. You could have two really credible conversations across a social media platform or you could spend three hours randomly posting graphics and sales and advertisement notices across the internet and you're wasting your time because people don't resonate with it and it doesn't convert as opposed to a couple of positive, credible conversations with people who may not be a customer today or tomorrow, but will remember you as somebody who shares knowledge and advice online. And do you know, Kelly, the, so we have a couple of comments here. So Janika said, I find it difficult to share advice when you sell products. Yeah, what do we say to that? Well, you know, it's very interesting. So, so I've, I've worked exclusively um, across social media platforms for 12 years and, and, and she's absolutely right. What I think is the key if you're selling products and of course, you know, you're not popping on the internet and every day somebody's saying, let's say for example, home decor products, you know, people aren't necessarily asking for advice constantly on interior design or home decor. However, if within that space, you're able to just literally I can't put it any simpler, be a nice person. And if it's a particular group or it's a particular feed or if it's a particular platform, people will remember names and will remember consistent comments. And it, it, it's almost a brand visibility for your name or the name of your business. And again, we can't disassociate from that. So say I sell, I sell shoes under the, under the brand name Wonderful Shoes. I'm not always going to be able to contribute online and be able to drop in well here at Wonderful Shoes because it sounds disingenuous. But my name would always be attached with that brand, even if we're not discussing shoes or we're not. So I'm not talking an acre about wasting your time going around the internet, being, just being a nice person and it not being able to convert. However, when you have the opportunity, it's more about focusing again, your ideal paying clients and where, where they hang out. So if it's interiors, for example, or fashion, where are these people hanging out and can you participate in conversations around that? And that will eventually lead to, so using Female Fusion as an example. So we're a non-promotional group on Female Fusion. However, there is no issue with, if in the thread of comments, somebody says, all right, or I sell this, all right, what, what's your links? Completely allowed because it's relevant. The conversation is around that subject. So it's completely irrelevant to be able to share your business, share your links, or talk about yourself directly. Um, and no issue with, this is how relationships start. And sadly, and I do think it's quite sad really, that most of our relationships are built online. And I don't think that that's going to change anytime soon. So getting our kind of selling strategy together for social media is as important as anything else. Yeah. So request for help. Ask the questions. Um, there's tips and tricks as well as ways to be able to do it and, 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 and look genuine. Um, I won't go into that now, but, you know, on the Internet, request for help and also respond to a request for help. Can you be useful? Can you show any kind of goodwill to somebody who's asking a question? Even, even actually if 
you can't offer a direct answer, but just to show support and solidarity, because I cannot tell you how important that is to a lot of people as well. Um, we've spent a lot of time alone or simply within our own family bubbles in the past 12 months and not doing any kind remotely of the social interaction, travel, networking, etc. That, that we would in, in, in usual times. And, and this affects everybody, even the most confident of women. This is a chance for a little bit of human interaction that really does mean a lot. So simply by responding to a request for help um, will resonate with somebody 100%. And again, being authentic, an authentic conversation around a specific topic. Going back to Janaika's comment in the, um, in the chat box, Jen, being authentic, an authentic conversation around your topic without trying to sell yourselves too hard. And you might feel that that's not achieving the point of you growing or developing your business or being able to get your business name in there or or a direct promotion for your business but i cannot stress enough how there's nothing less inauthentic than somebody trying to be authentic there and, and yeah. it resonates and people notice it from a mile off an authentic conversation you just being yourself and being a helpful person on the internet really really resonates with people and they remember it so of course and you, you see and exchange your information I, I just want to add to this as well, Kelly, that it, especially in a lot of groups on Facebook, and this is where a lot of um, communities are at the moment and where there are opportunities to sell or to be able to build your reputation, that oftentimes people will use the search function as well. So this is why it's really useful that if you're providing advice or information, that maybe you might not get the sale with that person, but somebody else, and I've done this a number of times, and I'm sure a number of you do as well, if you're looking for something, rather than going and posting again within the, the group, that you might actually search old posts to see what there, there is. So that's why it's really important, rather than just saying, I can help, to actually go and give the answer and explain it, and then saying, if you want more information, you could email me or feel free to DM me. That's where the opportunities are for you as well. 100%. And also, you know, there's a really, really important two words that I use quite a lot at the moment. Um, and again, more important than ever. And that's the, the, the notion of it's really important part of your marketing strategy, full stop, um, a phrase called social proof. And what does that mean? Exactly what Jen's just said, search. And that applies also on the next slide as well, because whilst it's a benefit that people can search your name or your business name or simply around the topic of what you're talking about, be it interiors, be it fashion, etc., a benefit is that your name is associated with that topic when people come to search. By the same token, your name will also be associated with things that you might not want it to be as well. And again, that comes down to you having a serious obligation to present yourself online in the way that you want to be seen. Request for help, be authentic, share and be supportive. It will hold you in very, very good stead, even if it's not a direct opportunity to promote your business or services. Now, Nithya asked a question and she said, to showcase genu genuineness, I noticed small business owners posting personal day, day life, et cetera, on social media. I personally am not comfortable with it. How to approach this sudden change noticed, especially on Instagram business platforms? No, well, again, you're absolutely right. And, and I have this conversation constantly with um, with women in business. Um, and again, it's a session for another time, right, um, is, is on content strategy and, and authenticity. And please, you know, ignoring everybody out there now going, be yourself, take loads of videos, it needs to be about you, you need to show behind the scenes. Yes, you do. However, it's not always convenient. It's not always appropriate. You've got issues of privacy. You've got issues of confidence and turning everybody, and I mean everybody, all of a sudden into TV presenters. It is, it, it, it's not, we're not TV presenters. You know, it's not why we started doing what we do if, if we sell products or particular services. It is quite an important part of your strategy. However, I do coach uh, female entrepreneurs on their marketing strategies. And the one thing that I will always say is I really want all of you to be, you have to have one. You absolutely have to have one and you have to be doing more of it and more of it well. However, what you need to be doing is doing it with ease. And it's a bit like selling exactly what we're talking about today. You have to find a way that suits you, that the boundaries are set, it's okay. Yes, you do need visibility. Everybody needs a marketing strategy and visibility, but it is okay for that marketing strategy or that visibility online or off for you to be done your way. No, yeah. no guru out there sets the rules for you and tells you how many times to post or what to post. That's entirely down to you. And trust me, it's okay. 
and of course what not to do <laughs> so now this is a bit 50 50 we see this every day in the chat box can you tell me in the chat box if you like to do business via dms because we found it's actually quite cultural we found a distinction between people of certain nationalities this is no bad thing by the way between certain nationalities and others with regards to the whole dm thing and people genuinely think they're building relationships and business by saying oh i'll dm you rather than writing what it is that you offer who it is or that bit of advice or help now of course sometimes a dm is completely relevant sometimes information sensitive sometimes it's about pricing of course we don't all plaster everything online about everything but if it's literally like i'm looking for a business setup consultant um, I'm going to open a shoe shop in a free zone. Anybody got any recommendations? And then the first comment underneath is, I'll DM you. Why? Why not write, my name's Barbara. I'm a business setup consultant. Um, I deal with free zones all the time. Um, and here's my contact details. Get in touch as a bad example. But that's an example. Why DM me? What, what secret? Share it. Share it with other people. You then get to do your elevator pitch publicly. And other people can see that you're credible and you know what you're talking about. Why on earth do you want to have this conversation privately? Yeah. To me, there's only you know, one reason and it's not going to be a positive one. You're, a, you know, you look like you're a spammer or you look like you're going to share something dodgy or any of these things. So the, the whole DM without permission or an obsession with sending direct messages rather than giving details publicly. And I will say this again, there's always exceptions. There's always um, information that you don't want sharing public. Of course there are. Let's use our common sense. It's an opportunity to promote yourself and the, the, the no, like trust factor, all the things we said about social media do's with regards to selling, you, you, you completely knock out of the water by just writing something like DM me. And the other thing we can say is it's not just about DMs or I'm interested or I can help, right? Okay, how can you help? I'm not gonna chase you, you tell me. I'm looking for a social media coordinator. I'm looking for somebody who can print this. I need some sustainable gifts to corporate clients for Ramadan. I need to engage with somebody who can fit out my office. I'm looking for an interior designer who can help me with my restaurant. I, all of these things, why then would your reply be, I can help? Like, and I think that people do it quickly because they're scrolling, they're in the car, they're, 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 whatever it is that they're doing. I don't think it's because people are stupid that they do that essentially, and I'm, I'm not saying that. But I think if we think a bit harder about how we do it, we're wasting an opportunity. Again, no like and trust. Like, here's your opportunity for your elevator pitch, guys. And of course, hard sell. Nobody likes a pushy salesperson. Not even online, you know. If you're constantly spamming threads of things or comments or posting irrelevant information that's just the equivalent of that graphic that I said before about fly posting and running. It's like running into somebody's house and plastering the walls with your posters or running into a restaurant and yelling at people, buy my shoes. You'd never do that in real life. You'd never do that on real life. And whilst there's a human being behind every smartphone or laptop or device, we have to talk to people like human beings and, and communicate in ways that we absolutely would do in real life. Marketing is really simple. Marketing is talking to people. And if we're doing that online via the power of a keyboard, or if we're doing it face to face, we have to talk to people like the humans that we are in a way that we represent ourselves and our business. Again, this is all covered, but irrelevant comments, it does not help you. It does not help you sell anymore by spamming a thread or something like that. Um, if you're just pitching blind, you know, you've got no rapport or you haven't built any kind of relationship, um, then you know it, it just doesn't work for you you literally waste it. it might not leave a particularly bad impression always don't get us wrong however it doesn't leave a great one and people aren't going to remember you and well, what's interesting kelly in the chat group pretty much universally most people say that they don't like dms right because uh, because we've number had of, this discussion before and there's a few yeah. people, really i do like a few really? a, a few people have said that actually that for them that works to do business but a lot of people have said that they feel that it's it's a bit dodgy, that they don't like that people send them DMs. And if they do get DMs, they overlook it and they don't even bother replying to them. So um, and then one person said as well that she, she doesn't like it when people say DM and then, you know, that's that's for the price or something like that, that they're not transparent with the price. And yeah. we're going to talk about that separately yeah, as well. Yeah. Um, I do I do want to touch on this um, negativity. So it goes a bit back to the kind of you being the personal brand as well. And I had this conversation on Clubhouse with somebody a couple of weeks ago regarding business and, and online. 
um, negativity, positive energy only. If you don't have anything nice to say, say nothing at all. It's not about not having an opinion, but it's also about, I do see people who feel that they have a personal brand as their business, but are also quite active on a personal level on social media. And it's almost like they're not putting the two and two together. So when I see all the nice shiny graphics and promotion for this particular business, but the person who runs it is across social media, let's say not doing anything illegal, but not giving the best impression of themselves. Yeah. Then we have to consider this as well. Sorry, you know, you can't, it's almost like there's no distinction anymore. And I do apologize for that. And privacy is super important. So think about that. Think about the chat you might have late at night in a Facebook group and how that would reflect on your business elsewhere or your name your name elsewhere associated with a business. Or pictures um, that you post on social media or Instagram that there's some people who are trying to have a very serious business profile and then will go and post pictures that are completely opposite to that yeah. on social media. And if your clients or potential clients see that, that might mean that you lose a sale. Because they will look, it's social proof and positive social proof from the previous slide, how people will find you online when either searching your name, your business or the topic around it, they're going to find the bad stuff. And like I say, I'm not talking about anything illegal, but if you have strong political opinions, for example, or if you have privately, you have a party lifestyle, which, you know, there's no judgment here at all. But if that's not associated with the business side of you that you're trying to promote and work on then just think about the kind of things that you post on a personal level as well because trust me the social proof is there and if they find the good stuff they're also going to find the not so good without a shadow of a doubt there's no hiding let's just not pretend there's absolutely no hiding and the lady online with me was saying you know i have quite strong it was about political opinions she said, i have quite strong political opinions and i do voice them in certain groups and you know, but I do worry that that would put off some clients. And I just said, well, you know what? Yes, it probably will. So what she has to do is either own it because you have to own it and say, well, do you know what? This is me. This is what I do. This is what I want to talk about. I feel really firmly in my opinions about animal welfare, for example. I'm not talking about crazy legal stuff here. I'm talking about things that, you know, can kind of create diff different opinions on online and people feel very strongly about, you know, I am not going to stop posting across social media about my love of welfare for animals. And if that upsets a potential client, then so be it. Well, do you know what? I think that's not a bad thing because what I would say, you, you just got to own it. You can't have it both ways. It's as simple as that. If you're going to have strong opinions on a personal level or a particular lifestyle or things like that, that you're going to share online, then own it. And yes, that will not, we're not all for everybody. Just like not everybody's ever going to be your client or your customer. Personally, we're not all for everybody. No like and trust factor is super important. Are you going to know, like and trust everybody? No. Is everybody going to know, like and trust you? No. And we just have to be grown up girls about it. And 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 that's just that 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 that's the way of the world. And and this is how it is. So we have to own that and accept it or if we don't accept it and actually think do you know what I could tone that thing down because really it's starting to affect my business then own that as well but either way stand in your power of it decide who it is you want to be online however that reflects but own it make a decision and own it and again transparency pricing this is a funny one Trans um, pricing is a funny one it's not always possible to talk about your prices it's not always relevant you might have a bespoke product uh, or service or something like that we completely understand that pricing um, transparent pricing online is something um, that I think is a little bit different to what to do and what not to do online however we see so many people who sell when I say basic products I'm not saying your products are basic but you again I always talk about shoes you have a range of shoes that um, you know this style is 100 dirhams this style, you know bags whatever and there's no prices. There's a lovely picture on Instagram and you're talking about how wonderful this bag is and what it's perfect for and the value it's going to bring to somebody's life. And it's a 75 dirham bag or a 250 dirham bag. People want to know. People want to know when they don't see pricing, they assume. What do we assume if we don't see pricing? I think this is pretty universal. I don't think this is cultural. I think it's pretty universal that when we don't see pricing, we think it's going to be too expensive. And, you know, the luxury products obviously don't don't advertise pricing and, and, and things like that. We get that. Um, if you are a service provider, you might have certain packages or you might do deals or offers or things like that. And yes, you that's where you do go into conversations in direct messages or sales calls. And, and that's completely different. But if you're selling products and there's no reason whatsoever to not share the price, 
share the price <laughs> because otherwise you're wasting their time you're wasting your own time in conversations if people can or can't afford you that you don't need to be having there's a product looks great there's the price job done totally what not to do online and we could talk about that for hours i think <laughs> we could talk about that for hours you ready for the next slide Kel? i am yes my lovely all right the other thing we need to make it easy for people to buy from you and this sounds like so obvious but i cannot stress how many people don't do it so you've got your social proof's fantastic you're beautiful online you've got a list of paying clients you're making sales and you're happy you've got you've got people asking what it is you do you've nailed that offer um you're communicating with people online and off you're doing you, you're doing the do it's all good and then the next step i want to buy from you jen how can i buy my shoes well well I, I bank transfer or my website's not ready yet and i well i i'm going to be at right market a week next thursday or i can sell you it but i live in Sharjah and you're in abu dhabi and next time you come to dubai we could meet no <laughs> confuse people do not convert how easy are you actually making it for people to buy from you so we recommend that you really look at the toolkit of offering multiple payment options we know it's fiddly we know payment gateways feel expensive for example example for selling online we know they feel expensive we know it looks like they're difficult to set up and might take a couple of weeks yes they do there's no win-win overnight solution that's free that's going to cost you nothing but give you have to you can't people if people can't buy from you <laughs> literally buy from you you can't sell them anything you don't have that money in the bank and you haven't made the sale you're not going to get the testimonial you're not going to get the customer feedback and you can't move on to the next so yes Payment gateways, for example, they do cost a little bit of time to set up and they do cost a little bit of money. Nothing really comes for free. So you must offer multiple payment options and bank transfer, cash on delivery, cash credit cards, all these options. If you can cover as many angles as it's feasible for you to do, and when I say feasible, cash on delivery brings its own problems. Having a credit card terminal to sell if you're at a market or if you're somewhere more portable, it's not always an option. Bank transfers, yes, perfect. But let me tell you, if you ask me for a bank transfer and I really want to buy your product, you're going to get it in about three days because I'm going to forget to do it. I want to pay you. I want the, you know, that kind of thing. We're going to talk about leaving money on the table later on. But let's say you've worked so hard on finding the customers and getting to the point of sale and you're not able to serve them. You're literally not able to take the payment. So please have a look at the toolkit that suits your business where you can offer multiple payment options to be able to get that money in that bank for you. And you've got things like... Um, it's possible to have a full functioning website with a payment gateway. You've obviously got invoicing and bank transfers. Um, you've got all of that. And then a lot of people who have a setup when it comes to payment options also use things such as other services are available. Zabuni, because you sell by WhatsApp, which is sounds crazy really in business. However, in the UAE, the saturation obviously of the usage of WhatsApp, none of us can ignore it. And if you can send somebody a quick link, and boom, they've paid on the credit card and it's done. Everybody's happy, everybody's happy. So it can be as simple as that. There is lots of things out there that can help to make it easier. And we shouldn't procrastinate. We should make it as easy as possible to people to buy from you, whatever it is we're selling. These online payment portals are not just for products. They're not just for products. There's nothing that you can't take money for, obviously legally licensed, but you know what I mean. Websites that work. Are all your links working? Have you copied and pasted something too quickly? Is there any call to action on your Instagram account that clearly obviously tells me where your shop is, where your website is, how people can contact you or how they can buy from you? It sounds crazy, doesn't it? I opened an email from somebody the other day for a download. There was no link to download it within the email. So, so easy to miss, so easy to miss. And it's not a criticism of women who are out there trying actively to gain more customers and sell more. If you do have lead magnets on your website, if you do offer things like that, and you've taken the time to build it in and have an automated process, I salute that completely. More people need to do these things. More people need to be selling harder, as in giving more opportunities for people to be able to create relationships with them. But you have to make sure that these things work as well. And it's so easy. It's so easy to miss a link here or to miss a call to action in any of your social media posts or, 
or things on your website to go awry or break. But please, please, please make sure it's really, really easy for people to buy from you. And that means do all your links for your products and services work. Can, can I physically buy from you if I wanted to? Your prices, are they displayed? How can we contact you? How can we be in touch? Where are you going to be if you've got a website, but you often do markets? If, if um, you're going to be at a networking event, if, if it's just your phone number, where clearly, because again, confused people don't buy. And if it's the kind of product or service that somebody will very quickly look elsewhere for, say to, you know, you want to chat to a couple of accountancy firms to be able to, you know, decide who it is you're going to use for your business, lawyers or things like that. If I go on your website or any of your social profiles or anywhere else, and it's not really quickly, easy, easy for me to know how to get in touch, I'm on to the next one. At the drop of a ham, we spoke about prices and di being displayed previously, so I won't go over that. But it's so easy to overlook these elements that actually somebody who wants to buy from you or who is interested in taking that first step and building a relationship. And again, actually, one thing I will add to this, Jen, making it easy for people to buy from you. If people are tagging you online, I'm looking for a financial advisor. Well, I know, you know, I'm going to tag a, a certain person because that's what she does to be useful. If you're the person tagged, please, please, please check back in and respond to that tag. Because again, people, you, you've lost a sale. People will move on to the next person. You've lost a relationship or an opportunity as much as if somebody's coming to knock on your door at your shop and you're closed. It's the same thing. So if you are going to have an online presence, please be easy to respond, be quick to respond and let people know that you're there if you're tagged or mentioned online. Thank, them, thank the person who tagged you and start a conversation with the person who's looking for your help. Make it easy for people to buy from you. Kelly, I'd be interested to hear from women who are watching today. How many of you have multiple payment options for your clients? Is it easy for them to buy from you? You could write in the chat box. We'd love to see that. And it's no, look, there's no judgment here or anything else that it's sometimes we're so busy setting up our business or running our business that we completely forget about that. It's that we're so focused on the product and we forget. Yes, yeah, so quite a few people say that they, they do have multiple ones. Some yeah, good. Know. That's great. That's good. Anecdotally, we've had lots of conversations over the past 12 months about cash on delivery um, because we know we know it's a very popular payment option um, in the region or was. Um, a lot of people do a lot of business with products, usually fashion-based, um, on cash on delivery, but it became becomes quite problematic when people don't hand over the cash or refuse the delivery. And the answer to that was stop offering it. They will still buy from you. You're making it too easy for them to mess you around, yeah. usually with cash on delivery. And again, boundaries, it's your boundaries to kind of say, no, here's plenty of other options. We don't offer it. And actually, COVID is a very good reason not to deal in cash as well. So you can take that from me as a great excuse not to um, argue with unintentional and people who don't want to pay you. On the, the cash on delivery thing, there's also another problem that some some small business owners have said to me is that there are sometimes we're because they don't have to pay for it that a customer will maybe order the same product or a similar product from three or four shops yeah. and whichever one is the first one that gets to them that's the one that they'll keep and then the other two they'll send back and go no i changed my mind i don't want it so you end up losing the money for the the courier because you've sent the product to the customer and then they've refused to pay for it so that's another reason why it's like no sorry no cash on delivery but i can send you a payment link over whatsapp or email or something like that so you're able to get your money right away I, I do understand that a lot of and again this is i guess obviously more relevant to product base and usually let's face it, it's usually fashion related or say kids toys yeah. kids products um there's a lot of a lot of customers who spend a lot of money who are loyal to businesses who like to operate on cash on delivery and nobody's saying that you should leave a you know a two thousand three thousand dirham uh, order on the table because you're not you, you know you're not taking cash on delivery you have a relationship with those customers you trust them they buy from you they prefer to pay cash that's think about it like in luxury retail and that kind of relationship management so it's not black and white to kind of say stop offering it but the boundaries are there for you with regards to unintentional customers who are doing exactly what Jen's just described who are probably you don't you don't want them on you, you don't want them on your database anyway yeah. you don't want them on the database and if it means and you lose 50, 50 100 dirhams once a year off them really you know, for the sake of your sanity and your time and your efforts, because dealing with difficult customers and clients, 
brings your mindset down it leaves you frustrated yeah. it can be exhausting and again boundaries which is probably a conversation for another day as well we could do an entire session on that yeah so Sarah and Maytap also said that they don't have multiple payment options because most of their clients are b2b and that's totally fine yeah. I have a b2b company as well and most of my clients prefer to pay by bank transfer and I like that because it's less friction for me in a way that it just goes straight into the company bank account. But there are occasions, and I don't know, Sarah and Maytap, if you find this, that I do have clients that are maybe really slow to pay, or maybe they said, oh, actually, um, could we pay by credit card? And, you know, that would be easier for me. So I do actually have an option for credit card payment. I don't use it a lot, but I do use that in the instance. For example, the other week I had a client from Saudi Arabia who said, if it goes through the company, it's going to take three months to pay you because you're not in Saudi Arabia. Can I pay by credit card and I'll expense it so you can get paid right away? So it's nice to be able to have that flexibility sometimes. Yeah, and that's a, that's a really good point, Jen, um, because again, we talk about toolkit, don't we? Like have it in your, you know, have it in your locker so like you, you're yeah. not going to miss out. Um, and a lot of, I think, things like payment gateways such as, um, is it Marmo Pay and obviously there's a Boonie as well, um, that make it super easy to people to do exactly what you've just described. A lot of... Um, there's a lot of assumption um, that you have to be a product business or essentially an online shop to use those services. Yeah. Quite the opposite. It's just, it's a really quick way to get paid by, and, and a lot of service providers, um, you know, a lot of service providers, coaches, etc. you know, B2B, it's just about, it's about getting paid. It's that simple. Yeah. And giving people an easier option. It's not that they don't want to pay you, but as you've just described, sometimes it can be just easier and people just want to whip the credit card out. And, and to have an option that's cost you nothing to set up, usually in these circumstances, um, there's a small transaction fee like there is anywhere. Yeah, um, and, you know, you know I weighed that up. Matters. So I've been asked by a few people if I could recommend a payment gateway, and there's a number of payment gateways out there. But for example, for me, with, with payment gateways, it costs money to set up a payment gateway, an initial setup fee, and then it takes two to six weeks, sometimes longer, to get it set up. For payment gateways, there's a number of payment gateways like um, Teller, Checkout, uh, what, Pay for it. Uh, pay for it. There, there's a number of ones locally that you can use. Um, there's also more international ones as well. Stripe has come into the UAE, but the problem with Stripe is that you can only get Stripe if you have a VAT certificate. And unfortunately, Stripe at the moment, there's something that they're trying to negotiate, I was told, that it doesn't integrate with any platforms. So even if you have a platform that integrates Stripe, it will not work with UAE Stripe, but it will work with different countries. And then as Kelly said as well, if you want something quick, uh, there's, I think there's Mamo Pay. We use Zabuni. I started using Zabuni in the summer and I sort of waited up for my business. It's three and a half percent, but I don't have any of the hassle of setting up the payment gateway and I only need it occasionally for clients. So it works out okay in the end. It's cheaper than PayPal because PayPal works out to about it's about 3.75%, but then they only charge in US dollars and then they transfer it back to your bank account in dirhams. So you lose money on the exchange rate as well. So it's not as convenient. And, and on the topic of getting paid in general and, and, and selling, um, I will touch on this because we find that a lot of people procrastinate and spend three months choosing a payment gateway for example and overall I think we can say with real certainty because again this is what we talk about and deal with day to day and different examples and different experiences good and bad without quoting you all now a list of who's available and what they charge it is all much of a muchness so if you spend three months trying to save 0.5 percent on transaction fees you'll find that then there's an extra charge for setup and when you add it all together honestly it sounds very very simplistic but charge wise for official payment gateways it's pretty much much of a muchness and obviously customer service can vary as well but if you think about having different options in again in your toolkit to be able to sell you spent three months researching researching a payment gateway you could have been selling from day dot 
if you'd set up Marmo Pay, Zabuni, et cetera. So it's, it, it's an easy way to procrastinate, stop yourself from selling as well, I think, is, is oh, but the, the payment gateways take so long and, and I've been looking at this and I'm not thinking about that. And all this time that you could have been spend, spending on, you know, on, on client relationships and selling more. Yeah. So at the end of the day, they're all pretty much the same. So just choose one and go for it. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Yeah. Okay, I've already touched a little bit on communication habits. Kelly, do you have anything else you want to say on that? No, I think we have touched on it, but I just think to reiterate, there's no doubt about it. We're obviously in the, the beautiful melting pot of cultures and nationalities um, that is the UAE. And of course, people trade and build relationships and communicate differently um, across the globe. And here we are in the UAE with kind of, you know, everybody rubbing along together, doing business together and having a wonderful time. But it's important to recognize that how people engage online can be cultural. And we we'll use the word cultural to talk about the sense of habits and legacy and historical habits of, of, of behaving online. So we know that um, certain nationalities prefer to use WhatsApp and Messenger rather than sending an email or picking up a phone. Um, it's important that we're not offended by other people's way of doing business or to see something as unprofessional, vice versa as well, um, that unprofessional when actually it's simply the way that things get done. You know, <laughs> I never forget going to a meeting in Dubai Mall at 11 p.m. on a Friday night, um, having been called by a lovely person who became a very good friend and client. And it's a recognition of different cultural communication habits that when somebody requested to meet me in a mall at 11 p.m., 10 p.m. ish on a Thursday or a Friday night, I think it was, that that was okay. If that was in the UK, that had just seemed like the strangest thing ever and it'd be a massive red flag. However, again, um, different nationalities working together and different communication styles, it, it's not always that. So again, we have to look at our own boundaries, how it is we prefer to do business, but also not discount how other people, nationalities and cultures prefer to do it as well. And I, and I think it's important that we recognize that and work that into our strategies and accept that you're gonna do a lot of business via WhatsApp, other nationalities are gonna prefer something different. Um, Justine, I've literally just done a sale on Instagram. I think that's, um, I'm just looking at her comment. I've just done a sale on Instagram through voice notes left by the client in my company's chat box. It really pushed me out of my comfort zone, exactly. Well done for the sale, Justine, can I just say? <laughs> well done for the sale. I don't like answering the phone. And also everybody hates me because I do voice notes. Yes, <laughs> it drives me crazy. I hate typing. I hate typing with a passion. If I can just speak to you, if I can just leave you a quick voice message, that's what I'm gonna do. Apologies, everybody. So we all have our different styles, which doesn't make it bad or good. You know, harassment or things that are inappropriate is, is kind of completely different. But again, it's entirely up to you and your business and your boundaries, how you set those communication levels. So if you work five days a week and the weekends are your own, you don't have to respond to a WhatsApp message. There's nobody making you, yeah. um, you know? Yeah. Thank you, Yvonne. Yvonne's a fan of voice messaging. Yes. It's a way for Hey, Yvonne and Kelly can yeah, go off and send on, each other voice notes. notes. Sheeta, I prefer voice notes. Writing's tedious. Yes, it is. <laughs> so, yeah, it's just an awareness. It's just an awareness that there's some very clear differences in, in, in how people prefer to do business in the region. And if we recognise that and we set our own boundaries, and more importantly, we're accepting of that, um, it's important because, you know, even if it's out of your comfort zone, a sale's a sale, right? Yeah, and I still accept Kelly, even though she sends me voice notes. I like to type. I sing sometimes too. She does. She sends me singing notes. <laughs> Who doesn't want one of those? <laughs> Everyone wants that. <laughs> so, um, I, I've received a few direct messages from you, so I think I'm just going to say it to the group, just in case anybody's wondering. I've been asked what time we're going to wrap up at, and the aim is to finish at around 11.30. So we've got about 17 to 20 minutes, and we'll get through this, and I want to have a bit of a discussion at the end as well. So I'm going to dive right in and cover off a bit more uh, on, of content. And one of the things that... I find is really important in selling is developing authentic relationships. And by that, I mean, um, and this is whether you're services or whether you're in um, products, it's really important to have relationships with your clients or your customers. For example, there's a woman who I met, somebody had recommended her to me because she sells vegan handbags. Those of you who know me, 
I'm a vegan. I am big into sustainability and products that aren't made from animals. And so I'm always on the lookout for things like really interesting accessories, handbags, shoes. And somebody messaged me and said, oh yeah, you should see this woman's handbags. And she was running a competition at the time and had tagged me on this competition. And I looked at it and thought, oh yeah, those handbags are really nice. So I bought a handbag and the woman was really sweet. The same day she came and personally delivered the handbag to my house and I got talking to her and I got to know her about um, the handbags that she was selling and her vision for the business and she was saying to me oh you know I'll update you if I'm uh, going to have new products in and every once in a while she'll send me a new picture of a product and go what do you think of this or I'm going to be getting shoes soon what do you think and I don't buy from her every month but I might buy from her once in a while and I see that and get kind of excited about the new vegan handbags or the vegan shoes that she might have in stock. So I find that that way, it's not intrusive, it's not pushy, it's more just her checking in with me to see you know, if I like her products, I'm one of her customers, if she gets this product in, would I like it? And I have started to almost build a little bit of loyalty and kind of cheer for her because I think her handbags are stunning and I really like buying from her also because she's a nice person. So when you're building relationships with your clients, there's many different touch points and it depends what type of business you have and what type of clients you have and what you're looking for from that. So it could be anything from having regular meetings with them or once in a while just checking in calling them to check in i found i recently set up a new business and i reached out to a number of my clients over telephone and a number of my clients were like oh you know i was just thinking about this i actually really need this can you send me a proposal so there are a number of different touch points that we can to build those relationships. Other things that people do, so I put down, you can meet people at networking events or conferences or training, or the other thing you could do as well is maybe go and put on um, events for your, your clients or customers as well, whether it would be um, a little training workshop. For example, the other day I ran a training workshop for a client. I didn't charge them for it, did it for an hour, wanted to help them out. They've been a client in the past, but felt you know that would be a good way to help build the relationship with my client even more. Natasha has said, what's the best way to approach new clients who are not in your network? So that goes back to identifying who are those clients that you would like to have and where are you going to find them? find ways of being able to reach out to them. So it, for example, if you're B2B, LinkedIn is a really great tool to be able to, to use to build those contacts. But when you do that, one of the things, how many of you hate getting messages over LinkedIn where it's like a direct sales pitch right away? I get two or three of those every single day somebody DMing me, doing the direct message. To me, it feels exactly the same as getting a DM over Facebook or Instagram. I hate it. I hate it. You know, I, I just sort of feel like, how is that going to help me want to do business with you? And then, you know, they send it to me again two months later. It's almost like they've done a social media course on LinkedIn and somebody told them that that's the way to sell. And it makes me feel really uncomfortable. So I wouldn't recommend going and doing your sales pitch. This again is where it is down to relationships. So you might find them on social media groups. You might find them in networking groups. I really like the, the business groups in the UAE. And there's a number of business groups across the Emirates for different nationalities or different kinds of businesses. And I found that I've met quite a diverse range people from business groups like that and it's even resulted in business for me as well but that's where you need to go with an open mind not doing the hard sell maybe have uh, your elevator pitch ready and I will have an elevator pitch for my business but I never ever pitch for business I never pitch for business it's more kind of like yeah this is what I do this is my company and I find if somebody is interested that they'll actually say to me oh you do that Oh, really? Um, okay, could we maybe have a conversation further? I typically, in my business anyways, for B2B, I'm a bit more subtle about that. So I try to build the relationship 
build the trust. And then I find that the client trusts me more and would want to come to me for the work as well. The other thing to mention, Jen, and I know this is going this is a bit more deep dive and we're not going to go into it. There are ways to do business via direct messages. You know, communication is communication. Yes. Um, whether it's via messenger, WhatsApp or, or a LinkedIn message. I want to reiterate that none of us are dismissing it as a way to to build relationships. But I think what we're saying is when it comes basically to it's cold calling, it's equivalent of a spam phone yeah. call. It's the equivalent of pushing something through your door you don't want or, you know, approaching somebody in the street and doing it. If it's cold, it doesn't work. And yeah summing up everything that we're talking about here today you know what ladies your power of relationship building of nurturing and empathy and morals and ethics in most things that women do and have naturally it's your superpower we're just we're just conditioned or overpowered by pushy sales tactics that puts us off from doing it ourselves it's these this nurturing and relationship building that we almost have inherently just just by virtue of of, of of our of our physical makeup really is absolutely our superpower women can yeah. sell better we just have to start and do you know there are ways on linkedin for example if you see somebody posts an article or post does a post that you can comment on that and you start to get noticed if you comment regularly on people's posts to be like, oh, you know, there's Hiba has commented on that post uh, on my post for the past two, three weeks. And uh, let me take a look at Hiba and see if, you know, maybe she's similar in my industry. Maybe I might like to follow her or you know have a bit of a conversation with them in the chat flow within those messages as well. It's you have to think with relationships, you need to play the long game. It's and not something that's going to happen in a week, two weeks. It takes time to go and build that. Yeah. And there's an R word, Jen. There's another R word alongside relationships. And again, summing up everything that we're talking about today and visibility and how we present ourselves face to face or online. Not everybody's going to be our customer, but what does a good yeah. relationship, what can a good relationship lead to? Oh, yes. I love this. And this is something that people forget as well, is that they might not need or services, but maybe somebody they know does Referrals. and they'll recommend you. Referrals. And, do you know, I, I had a situation, I'm going to tell a story. I had a situation a few months ago where I was at an event and one of the women at the event came up to me afterwards and said, I can't believe how rude this person was. She said, this person came down, directly asked all of us sitting at the table what we did and then stood up and said, well, I'm not going to get any business from you and walked away. And I was mortified. I could not believe, one, that somebody was so rude, but two, that they didn't understand. And for example, the, these women that were sitting at the table were phenomenal. They might not have been in her industry, but let me tell you, those ladies have a lot of connections and know a lot of people where they could have referred business to this person if they had really impressed them. And so that's where you need to think as well that you might not get business from them, but they might recommend you to somebody else. And so don't discount those relationships because they lead to something as well. Um, I'm just wanna, I, Sabine has just left a message um, and I and I want to respond to that. She's talking about having spent her time basically for 12 yeah. years um, sharing information about fair trade and sustainability with schools, planning lessons and materials, but nobody wants to pay her for it. Um, incredibly frustrating and challenging. Again, and maybe a topic for another session, boundaries and pricing. Um, you set the boundaries, Sabina. You're passionate about what you do. I'm sure you're amazing at it and you're creating impact with your work. But you, you know, it's not your hobby. You want to be paid for it. You feel that you should be paid for it now, and you're feeling that resistance. And my advice to you would be: it stops today. You know, you flick that switch, even if it takes a little bit longer than today. Flick that switch and decide that I will do X amount of hours per week, per month, per year, um, on a pro bono basis to certain establishments. If that's how you feel, um, because you still want to create that impact. But apart from that, yeah, I can help you. Hey, can you come and do a talk at our school? I can. Here's my rate card and what it involves. That's not rude. And it's not rude. If you're not asking, if you're not asking to be paid, then people will take advantage and will assume. They absolutely and will. And by asking to be paid, it's not being rude or aggressive. Of course. When I say that simply, does it sound that simple? You know, like, 
just yeah I can help you here's here's my rate card this is what it costs yeah I but do. also as well maybe Sabina is maybe schools aren't necessarily the best target audience for you maybe Absolutely. schools are not going to pay for what you do maybe you need to look at other organizations that would be willing to pay whether it's universities or businesses or government maybe rethink who those target audiences are who's going to be your ideal paying client if the schools aren't going to pay so the other thing to no. remember is um not every idea is a good idea not every business idea or what you think you'd like to do and get paid for is necessarily going to convert into business. You could spend years working on a sales strategy, but if it's not a product that fits the marketplace, if it's not a service that's relevant or in demand right now, there's, there's no, there shouldn't be a fear of failure. Not everything is a great idea. We all have to pivot, stay agile, rethink our packages and services constantly. And we'll, we'll touch on that slightly going forward. But yeah, um, culture plays a role. We, we've talked about this lots. And, you know, some people are happy to do a deal or buy your product after the first meeting or contact. Others take several meetings and encounters. And we find this a lot working with government and um, locally based companies um you know the relationships are absolutely everything we really really want you to identify one current customer or potential customer and if today even better but soon you've identified a wish list you you're going to you know write down make a list of potential clients in the previous action that we asked for you to do send an email today tomorrow but soon Think about one person who you do have a, some kind of relationship with or you've got something that's relevant to offer them and you can invite them to an event or an activity. You can provide them with information or organize a meeting. Yes, slightly out of your comfort zone, I'm sure. However, it's not rude. It's not rude to reconnect with somebody. Ask them how they're doing. Hey, I've seen this. I've seen this business event or whatever relevant, relevant event um, or activity that I'm thinking about going to even an online webinar. You can say, I saw this and I thought of you. I'm going to be joining. Why don't you join with? And even if they don't attend the webinar, right? Even if they, they can't make it or they don't, you've had a reason to make to, to re-establish connections with somebody that you might not have done before because you'd be you, you'd feel afraid that it was salesy. And what happens then? Hey Jen, yeah, I'm I'm doing well. Oh, I can't make next Wednesday, but how are you? What are you up to? Oh, well, actually, that's really interesting. because I've just launched a new business and I, you know, it, how's that going? Well, we're doing these start relationships and conversations. And so many of you are afraid to even just reestablish connections and conversations because you don't want to do the sales. And it's yeah. not about sales. It's about relationship building that leads to potential sales or referral or brand awareness that will come to fruition in, 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 in the future. And this has been a big topic, Jen, in the chat box, hasn't it? About closing yes. the deal. Yes, uh, closing the deal. This is a challenging one, but I think, so there's a couple of things with closing the deal. One, and I hear this from clients. I, I, I've been working in my business area for 20 years. So I feel quite comfortable with working with clients, with doing a pitch, with closing the deal. Now my area is more B2B services rather than products. So Kelly will be able to give more insight into the products as well. But a lot of the principles are the same. One of the first problems why people struggle closing the deal, and I hear this from clients, is that the person who is speaking to the potential customer or client doesn't listen. So they don't ask questions and listen, and listen to the reply on what the client's needs or requirements are. And I, I hear this from clients and they'll say to me, they're like, you know, you were up against like four or five other businesses, but the reason why we chose you is that you're the only person who listened to us and actually listen to what we needed, gave us some advice when we had those meetings, and then gave us the offering that we were really looking for. Everybody else tried to sell us what it is that they wanted to sell us because it was easy for them, it was off the shelf, and you were able to listen to us. So it's really important to be able to adapt to those customer clients' needs and requirements. And I know, especially in this country, it can be a little bit challenging because clients can be very demanding and ask a lot. And this also can be a bit of a, a challenge as well. And because sometimes they'll ask for a BMW, but then they'll have the budget for a Ford. And that's really important to understand in the beginning about what their budget is, because sometimes their budget will be so low that it won't be worth 
you actually even pitching for the business. And that's okay. For example, I had somebody who contacted me a, a couple of weeks ago and she wanted me to provide a service for her. And the service that she was looking at was probably going to cost about 25,000 dirhams for what they were looking for. Her budget was two and a half thousand dirhams. So there was no way, there was no way I would have even been able to have done that without losing money. It would have cost me money. And I explained that to her in a very nice way. And she said, just look, our, our business isn't at that phase. And so I said to her, look, let me give you a bit of advice. Look here, do some research here, make sure that you do this preparation and that will get you started. And she came back to me and she said, you know, thank you so much. You know, I know we couldn't work with you now, but I hope we're going to be able to work with you in the future when we have no budget. So do keep that as well. Don't dismiss the people who have no money and just cut them off or not talk to them. Remember, it's all about relationships. But when you are closing the deal, make sure that you show them the value in your offer, your product or your service. And it also helps as well to highlight the cost of not buying this. And especially Kelly, Kelly as well. Kelly, you're very big onto this, um, both for services and products as well. That's right. Um, the cost of not buying it. Well, it's the equivalent of it's the equivalent of going with the cheapest contractor, right, to build your house, to renovate your shop, or or any of those things being personal or business. Going with the cheapest contractor. I don't believe you know they say buy cheap, you buy twice. Um, cheap is always bad. Um, you know, there's so many discrepancies around pricing, but yeah, that's the, that, that's a good example of the cost of not buying. The cost of not yeah. buying um, at quality levels is you're going to have to redo that kitchen. You're going to have trouble. In, you're going to have trouble in the future with leaking. With you know, using a house as an example. Um, you know, you can convey that via your marketing and strategies. Um, yes, we're not the cheapest, but this is why, <laughs> you know, this is why. And you stand in the power of your pricing. And it's important to be a good client as well as a good customer, because we have things, you know, don't go to, don't be a solopreneur who wants to work with a particular PR agency with a budget of 600 dirhams a month. But don't be the PR agency who then sits through six meetings and this happens. And then, and then, you know, have six, a potential client have six meetings with them and then find out their budget. It's a conversation you can have right from the start. And again, this comes all the way down to negotiating. So negotiating yeah, is, is, is so important. It's not about doing a deal. Um, so you go away feeling hard done by pricing wise. It's, it's, it's a combination of them, them feeling like they've got value. They've got a good deal. They're happy to work for, with you. And also on your behalf, ladies, that you go away happy with the deal that you've just done. So, you you know when you're negotiating and there's objections or you know you're feeling a bit of friction with regards to pricing or the contract or what it is that you're offering you know you really have to show the value of what you're offering why you versus anybody else and only you can bring what you and your business and your brand uh, brings to the table and you really 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 need to convey that um, I'm really big on discounts and when I say I'm big on discounts I mean I I hate them. Not giving them. <laughs> yeah, well, no, that's not, look, there's a time and a place for everything. But the first thing I could guarantee you guys that the first thing that when you're feeling you're in negotiations and you're feeling some resistance to somebody actually, you know, putting the money on the table and signing with you or taking your product, your one of your first reactions is going to be, I'm going to make that price cheaper. And you absolutely don't have to. You never instantly offer discounts. You can offer extra value if it's going to sweeten the deal, if it's competitive and it means a lot to you. You can put something else in. And I always say something that doesn't cost you money, if that yeah. makes sense. So it's not like giving an extra pair of shoes, again, shoes, but you know what I mean? Like, oh, I'll give you a pair free. No, that's costing you money. It's product. But maybe there's some extra value within your business that you can provide as a sweetener, as you know, in negotiations for this contract, for this deal, that actually doesn't cost you too much time and money and you haven't lost anything off the price. Never instantly offer discounts. It's something that can be discussed and let's face it, it's almost the first question that you get asked in the region. Can you do and this deal? And I'm going to talk more about this under procurement because I have a whole slide about procurement that I want to address because this can be very challenging, especially if you haven't dealt with procurement departments before. But um, on the discounts, I really believe because a common one as well out in this region is, well, you know, we're such a great brand that think about all of the business that you're going to get if you work with us and we're going to refer you and talk, talk about you to all of our contacts. How many of you has that happened to? Probably quite a lot. And almost always it doesn't happen. 
and you don't end up getting other business. It's their way of trying to get a discount of you, off of you. So try not to be bullied with that either. So, and if they are expecting a discount, find that out in advance. So I often have a conversation because typically what you will have is you will have a team who wants to buy the product or service from you. And then you have the procurement team that you end up dealing with. So what I will do is I will speak with the client, especially if we pretty much agreed that we're going to work together and say, right, so we've agreed the price, all of this is good. Or is it going to have to go to procurement? Because, um, and I think as well, let me just move to the next slide on procurement, because what happens typically is procurement will get in touch with you and go, we've taken three offers and your price is 50% higher than everybody else. We want a discount. Do you know the first time that this happened to me, it was actually in Saudi Arabia, probably about 18 years ago. My very first massive contract that I had. I thought that I had a deal and then, you know, I was celebrating and everything else. And then I get a message from procurement saying, we want a 50% discount. And I was nearly in tears. I was like, what? I had budgeted this product project. I knew what it was going to cost. And the client is asking for a 50% discount. I called the, the contact that I had and said to him, you know, they're asking for 50% discount. I can't do that. I'm going to lose money. He said to me, he goes, Jennifer, Jennifer. He said, welcome to the GCC. He goes, this is how we do business. He goes, they tell you 50% and they have three offers. And you go back and you say, no, I'm sorry, that's the price. They come back again and they say 50%. And you say, okay, I'll give you 10% discount. They come back and say, no, we want 30% discount. And he said, and you go back and you say, okay, I'll give you 15% discount. Or he said, or, you know, maybe even like 10, 11, 12%. And then you have a deal. And what I didn't realize at the time, and I don't know if you're aware of this, is that a lot of procurement people get points or bonuses, or it's their KPI to negotiate contracts with their suppliers. And so they, they don't care that you're a small business. All they care about is that in their KPI, that they can say that they've saved their department X amount of money. So this is where, especially if you're looking at a big contract, and this isn't just B2B. For example, I've talked to people who will be providing things for events or for festivities, maybe like Ramadan hampers or gifts for Eid, and it will be for a really big organization where they might be providing 500, 1,000, 10,000. And so they wanna have a discount. And of course they're bulk buying, so they wanna have a discount. But that is where you need to go and find out from the person who you have originally done the deal with, how it works. And most often that you will have developed a relationship with them, that it will be easier for you to understand how that works. So I always do my research because it helps a lot. You need to understand that whole process because they will try to negotiate hard on the price. So we're, don't worry, ladies. I know a few of you are worried. We're almost done. But what I would say is that look at some of the, the deals with the negotiations that you've gone through in the past and look back and see how it went. When you won negotiations, what did you do? What worked? What didn't work when they went badly? What could you change? What can you do differently in your negotiation techniques? And I find every time that I go into negotiation with the client, I will use that as a learning experience. Because let's face it, we don't always win everything. And as you get more experienced and as you start to sell more, your ratio of winning will be much higher. But in the beginning, expect that you're going to get rejected. And please don't take it personally because it's business. It's really not personal. This is a great opportunity for you to see it as a training experience in a way that you're learning how to be better to negotiate for your business. And sometimes as well, I found it really useful if clients where I haven't won the business, if they'll talk to me, they'll explain to me why. Maybe it was my offer was too expensive. Maybe it was that my offer wasn't what they were looking for. Maybe somebody came in and they were super cheap and that's all that they had the budget for. 
So it really depends, but this is a great way for you to be able to, to look at that. Just remember, you're going to get better over time. Every time you do this, you're going to get better. So the silver lining to this as well is that just because the client says no initially, it doesn't mean that you're not going to work with them in the future. A number, and this, this is actually really important because I see this a lot on business groups and we see this in female fusion, that you might put your heart and soul into a proposal or a tender or be negotiating with a customer about something and you lose the business. It doesn't mean that you can't work with them in the future, but what will determine that is how you handle your rejection with the client and keep it professional. So you need to be able to keep it professional and be like, okay, that's fine. You know, I'm, I'm, I understand. I'm really disappointed. We were really hoping to be able to work with you, but use that as an opportunity, as I said, to learn and then look in the future, maybe getting back in touch with them. A number of clients that I have to this day went with somebody else first because they were cheaper. And they thought, you know what? No, we're going to go with the cheaper option. They're all like, we're comparing apples and apples. They're the same. And then they realized that the person that they chose that was maybe the 50% cheaper actually couldn't deliver what they wanted. And so they ended up coming back. But that's also because the way that I handled it, I was very professional with them and stayed in contact. And as well, just look at your pitches or your contracts that you didn't win. And look at ways how you would be able to maybe change that or reestablish a relationship. I really encourage you, if you have had clients where you've lost business, follow up with them. Six months or a year, you know, I'm going through processes now where I'm following up with clients that I lost business with, reestablishing contact. And they're like, oh, actually, yeah, I'm really glad, you know, you were in touch. We would like to work with you now. So it does free you up and give you lots of opportunities as well. Before. This is the penultimate slide. This is, is the last it slide, is, ladies. So just in case you're wondering, we're we almost there. We're running over. We know that we're running over. We have a question for you. Another last question, Paul, that the answer to which is really, really important to us and, and, and future training going forward. Please hang on for another minute or two. But I, I am, before we ask that question, I do want to ask you again, if you're leaving money on the table. So Roberta's talking about pricing, into, um, introducing an introduction sale price. Yes, absolutely do that. That makes perfect sense. A beta price, a launch price, something like that, 100%. Will it backfire down the line when bringing the price up? No, Roberta, because with boundaries, you'll be absolutely clear. One time only offer. It happens. Seasonal sales. You know, we can't be Pierre Cardin where was it per, permanent 75% off. Nobody trusts into a business such as that. Nobody trusts the pricing of a brand such as that. But if you absolutely have those boundaries and you stick to them, the first five clients, the first, you know, time frame, anything like that, and you do it, absolutely everybody loves a deal. Everybody loves a deal. And um, and and when you're at introductory prices for new businesses or services or packages are absolutely the way to go. I'm doing it at the moment in my business with something new that I'm offering. Um, and after the first cohort of clients, the price is going to double and it absolutely will. So, so totally, totally do that. Um, it, you know, it fits on certain circumstances such as that. And when are we leaving money on the table? What does money on the table mean? It means when you're losing out on opportunities to make more. So do you respond quickly? Do you say that you don't work weekends and then on a, on a Sunday morning, you know, you've got, um, you've had 25 messages over the weekend of people trying to buy something from you, for example, obviously usually in product and you haven't responded all weekend, but the weekend's a point where you're getting all the, all these messages. You want to, you know, you need to rework your working week. You need to think about, actually, we get a lot of opportunities over a weekend. So we need to look at being able to respond to that because you're leaving money on the table to you deliver on time. Is your customer service good? Yes. People are buying and they're not coming back to buy from you. Why is that? Are you always sending an invoice out on time? Do you complain? about not getting paid on time but your administration's not great invoicing correctly do you have those payment links to be able to send that whatsapp link through to payments somebody can pay you on credit card or you know you only take cash so that you you know people are walking away um because you can only take cash and there's so you know prompt payment requests all these things that you're getting sales but actually to sell more and better are you leaving money on the table with some of your administration and processors you can always sell more to existing clients and that's not just by discounting people love exclusivity can you come up with a bundle deal 
um, that's of interest to people who already work with you. Don't forget that usually 80% of your business comes from 20% of your clients. What more can you sell to the people who already know, like, and trust you? Um, and I really want you to double down on what works. So if one of your focuses is financially to be able to make and earn more money throughout your business, not everybody, some people are building, some people want to do more of this and less of that or have a different focus, I accept that. But if currently one of your priorities is to basically make more money and that's really important to you you know we've had a horrific year economically globally we fully understand that people are losing jobs people are you know businesses are slowing down etc we're on our way out of that and it's brilliant but the fact is we are where we are now and my advice to any of you would be to really consider what's working for you even if it's not your favorite part of your business even if it's not the favorite part of your business or the part that you love doing the most or that lights you up, the part of your business that's currently working for you, the thing that you're selling more of, double down on what works. If your priority is to earn more money um, currently, and that is your real first and foremost priority, look at what works for you, whether you like it or not, and double down on it, do more of what works. And there's so many, so many ways that we can have successful businesses or be happy and selling well or be comfortable, let's say, let's use the word comfortable in our businesses and services. But I could guarantee there's going to be at least five ways you're leaving some money on the table. So you might want to identify some of the gaps there and really ask yourself, honestly, are you doing everything that you can to make it easy for people to buy from you? And then the second question is, how can I get people to buy more? So these are the things that you can do right now. That audit that we talked about right at the very beginning, really look at what you're doing, what you've been doing to sell and be really brutally honest with yourself. Are you doing enough? Is there more that you can do? Your communications, you've got to get it right. That's your elevator pitch, that's your website, that's your links, that's all the calls to action on your social media. Um, have you got an email um, communication strategy? Have you got customers who you don't communicate with via email? Give it a go. People do read them even when other people will tell you that they don't. Is there any gaps in your approach and how you can make it easier for customers and clients to buy from you? Be brutally honest with yourself and identify these gaps. And of course, the mindset. You have to understand that business equals sales and sales equals growth. You have to recognize what it is that's stopping you because really, if I was to put this in one sentence, there's nothing stopping you, ladies. You just have to start. Back to basics and start. And after this session, we really want to ask you, via the poll question again, please, how do you feel about selling now? So from the beginning, we asked you how you felt at the start. Can we ask you how you feel now? After our discussion today, do you feel better about selling more of your products or services? And again, no wrong answers, please, just honesty. Yeah. It will help us with planning our trainings going forward and, um, and, and future help that some of you need. So thank you for your collaboration in this. And it would be really great if you could all fill it in because it really helps UN women. Yeah. It's see anonymous, that by the way. This is, completely anonymous. Yeah, we don't see what you say. We don't know who's saying yes or no. Um, we're not offended <laughs> either. There's there's no right or wrong answer, but it, yeah. it, it really, really helps us. Yeah. It really helps us. Um, there's a couple of questions. I know for those ladies, there's a few ladies who want to leave, but there's a couple of questions I wanted yes, to go back on. So there's one that uh, Amruta wrote and she said if I had to let go of a deal when the client didn't provide me with any kind of agreement PDC any document really for the payment which was orally promised after three months what can I do better next time in such situation the client was from the public sector okay this is th this is hard especially when you're first starting out right because you get a client who is like, yeah, we're ready to work with you. And you know, you want to get started right away. And sometimes you forget the procurement side of things. Please, please, please don't forget the procurement side of things. Do not start working without a contract or at the very least, at least a partial payment to start things going. Because so many things go wrong if you do not have that in place and you have nothing to fall back on. You cannot take your client to small claims court to get paid if you do not have a contract. A verbal contract is not enough for you to protect yourself. The other thing as well, remember that clients sometimes, you might have a client who wants to buy from you, but they don't understand or they have not followed the cor correct process of the organization. And this goes especially for government that 
public sector entities will have processes that you need to follow. So please do not enter into work with them until you have that organized and that there will be an obligation, especially if you're working with the public sector, that it needs to be contracted. When you are doing a contract as well, I would strongly suggest to all of you that you make DIFC courts, your court that you have for arbitration. Why? Because they have a small claims court and it is very, very easy for you as an entrepreneur to go and put a claim against that client to get paid. But you need to have a contract and you need to say that DIFC courts are the area of arbitration. It doesn't matter if you're in Sharjah or Abu Dhabi or Amalquain, you can use it. I have used it. And typically when the court of arbitration gets involved in DIFC, I have been paid within a matter of weeks, if not days. So it works and it's very reasonable. So it will help you as entrepreneurs. Amrita, I hope that answered your question. Don't know if anybody else has anything urgent that they wanted to ask from Kelly and I. Um, Thank you for your lovely feedback. Amrita, um, great. Excellent. Yeah, and sometimes, you know what, if a client isn't going to give you a contract, then it's the wrong client for you. Sometimes, do you know, I, I, I have 20 years of experience in this. And in the beginning, we want to go for everything, right? We want to win business. We want to win contracts. But as you get older and more experienced in doing this, you'll realize that you don't want to work with certain clients. It's okay to say no to them. And it's okay that, that they're not going to be the clients for you. And if it's important for you that you're going to have a client that's going to pay you on time and be professional in the way that they work, only work with those only work with those companies only work with those companies or organizations i say no to a lot now katie linkedin yeah i you know i despite being a communicator i i struggle slightly with linkedin and i think that's for a couple of reasons um i started my account back in 2009 a lot of my um connections are not people I would connect with now, for example, um, but approaching people on LinkedIn, Katie, I think for you, because I know what Katie does for a living, um, I think for you, having converse, having more visible conversations about what you do, now I know you're just really busy out there doing it and managing your family, um, to be able to work in some time to do a little bit of online networking in particular groups obviously would would, would be no bad thing or simply um, sharing information and industry news and being able to jump in and, and, and just having a visibility with your name, um, you know, just 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 by just by being more out there on platforms such as LinkedIn. But again, you don't have all the time in the world to go around networking there. So maybe you'll see a comment from somebody or somebody ask, look for you look at people who are doing a bad job <laughs> and connect with them and just say, ah, oh, see that you're, you know, maybe you'd like some help. Um, and that feels really icky. I know that feels really scary, but I, I don't think it, it's not irrelevant. If you can communicate in a way that's identifying where somebody needs help and that's what you do and can help them with. Um, I don't think that's a bad thing at all. I just think total cold spamming all your contacts is, is, is no networking's bad, but sending random DM messages to people. I get messages off people offering me marketing services it's there in my headline like it's like me writing to you Katie and offering you media training services you know like that like what like this is how badly people behave like what a waste of time what a you waste of copy read. and paste time you know I really yeah. think Katie just by being your because you are amazing and so personable um being more of your professional self online if that makes sense taking a little bit of time out of your busy schedule to con to consider an online networking approach i think on, on something like linkedin obviously which is ideal for you um just you know taking a couple of hours a week or or, or actually focusing on it um will will will, will definitely help getting started anybody else have any questions we're here to serve, we're here to help you. If there's anything else we can answer for you. If not, I, I think um, many of you know us anyways, but if you want, you can always reach out to us separately as well. It's the best way, probably um, Instagram maybe. Hey, Kelly? Yeah. Yeah, so um, I can write my Instagram down. You can always, um, 
you can send you can send me a dm i don't mind dms over instagram because not many people dm me over instagram i try to keep that a bit separate so feel free if you have any questions or anything like that same thing kelly if you want to write yours in the chat yeah i can't it's being weird for me pop mine in please jen because um i can only reply to one particular person via direct message it's not giving me the option to um to write it's kelly comms right I always get her email, her Instagram. Kelly Combs. It's not Kelly Whitehouse. Kelly Whitehouse. <laughs> yeah, Kelly Combs. There we go. Kelly Good. Well, Hibba, do you want to say anything before we close or can Kelly and I close it off now? You're muted, Hibba. <laughs> Oh, still not working. Sorry, Hibba, we can't hear you. Okay, well, I would like. We can't to hear Hibba. I would like to thank Hibba and um, United Nations Women and NAMA Women's Advancement Establishment for inviting us to deliver this session today. Thank you for your feedback and contributions. Um, we're yeah. hoping to work together much further in the future with uh, lots of exciting uh, training plans to be able to stimulate. Um, women in business in the UAE and um, provide growth and learning opportunities. So again, thank you, Hiba. And thank you to all of you for taking part. It was so nice to have such an interactive session. And that's what I love when we do sessions like this and people are really interactive and we have the discussion going. And I think we've seen as well that this format is great and I would like to do more of that when we have our next sessions as well. And Rubab says, when are we having the next one? There's going to be some soon. So we're working on doing some planning and we have lots of ideas and we're looking at the report because so many of you gave great feedback for from the report on um, areas that you're really struggling with. And we're going to look to try and cover off all of those different areas as well. So thank mm -hmm. you so much to everybody for your time. Um, and sorry, I was just checking my messages because I saw a message from one of the girls at UN Women. So I was just wondering if I missed a message to say, but thank you everyone so much for your time. And it was great getting to know you and to sharing our experience with you. And we hope it helped and we look forward to seeing you at the next one. We really do. Thank you, ladies. Thank you.